And now, it's time for TJ Wow. TJ. Well, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where in the world you are and when you are listening to this. Welcome to the Training Journal live video discussion webinar. This is me. I'm the Deputy Editor of Training Journal. My name is Joe Cook. I am going to be your host, your facilitator, and your moderator today. And Cara asks in the chat window, was that John Kay's voice? No, Cara, but you do know whose voice it is, so you could have another guess. Other people might not guess, but Cara, you've definitely met this person. This is a lovely quote from the late, great Jay Cross, and he says that conversation is the most powerful learning technology ever invented, and that is the most important thing in when discussing the format that we've got today. So we like to have our one opening question, and from there, we just chat. It is all up to you guys about how our conversation and our learning goes today. We've got the chat window, please use that just as you are for questions, comments to each other, to me, to our speakers. Uh, and Cara North is guessing that it was Mr. Green as I call him, yes, it's my other half Simon who did that recording. So uh, I like to involve him where I can in my work, I'm sure he loves it too when I say to him at 11 o'clock at night, could you just record me something? But all for the greater good. At the very bottom of the screen, we have a question and answer panel. If you absolutely, completely, desperately want to see your question answered, please pop it in there and I will place it to your speakers as you need. You can follow us on Twitter at Training Journal. You can go and get involved in the conversation, hash TJ Wow. And uh, all of our sessions are recording, you can, recorded. You can go and look at them all online, including this one will be on our YouTube channel very, very soon. So I think it's about time that we went and found out a little bit more about our speakers. We're going to get them to introduce themselves in just a few seconds. I am so, so pleased to have these three amazing people with us today. We have Mike, Ashley and Claire, and they're all going to have slightly different opinions, I think, on this topic and all really interesting. Let's get their videos on screen. Here we go. And we will also have some introductions from them as well. So we're going to find out a little bit more about each of our speakers, especially once I can actually resize the video properly. One moment, everyone, I'll get there. I promise I've done it before. I can do it again. I promise I can. Uh, so we are going to hear, first of all, from Claire, then Ashley, then Mike, a little bit about who they are and what they do. So Claire, who who in on earth are you? Uh, and tell us a little bit about what it is that you do. Well, hi. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and good morning. Um, I'm the Sales Enablement Director for Imparta, and we specialise in sales performance improvement uh, projects, mainly large-scale academies for global organisations. So we often work with L&D professionals, as well as people in operations and sales. Brilliant. Lovely introduction, Claire. Thank you very much. And um, Ashley, tell us a little bit about who you are and just what is it that you do? Let's get you unmuted. Hi, guys. Uh, I'm Ashley Sinclair. So I've worked in marketing for just under six years and my entire tenure has been in the learning technologies industry. So I kind of have a slightly different slant because I'm actually marketing to you guys and getting you to understand our brand and product. Um, so my stance kind of comes on a, a bit more of a different angle, um, but hopefully can help you. I'm very data driven, so <laughs> happy to. Excellent, sounds good, Ashley. Thank you. And as I said, we wanted different opinions and options and angles here. And lastly, we've got Mike. Mike, tell us who you are and what you do. Hi, my name is Mike Simmons. Uh, as I mentioned before, I'm uh, based in Arizona. I'm primarily a sales guy, uh, and from a sales perspective, focused on connecting the dots between problems that exist, whether they're known or unknown, and solutions that exist, whether they're known or unknown. And my connection to the ed tech space started back when I joined SmartForce back in 2000. Thank you very much. And Cara says in the chat window, you're more than a sales guy, Mike Simmons. And Jack says this is going to be a fantastic conversation. We hope so, Jack. Thank you for coming along. So let's come back to Claire, Ashley, and Mike and ask them just for their very first thoughts to get our conversational ball rolling. And our discussion point is what can L&D learn from sales about understanding the customer? Because as a stereotype and as a really broad brushstroke, we need to get better at this. Claire, what are your first thoughts about how we can improve on this? Um, 
Okay, so we meet some really, really talented L&D professionals and the ones that tend to have the biggest impact are the ones that have the highest amount of trust with their business partners. Um, and that's the, the same can be said for sales. Um, so in terms of winning new logo business or extending accounts or retaining accounts, um, then if you don't want to be a transactional uh, short-term partner, then trust is the most important thing. And that's made up of a couple of different aspects, which I'm sure we'll come on to talk about today. Um, but that will be the top number one um, uh, area that we've seen that's had the biggest impact from L&D. Thank you, Claire. I really like that point. And I love the point about not being a short-term transactional partner. So I'm going to leave that one in the chat window for us all to have a, a discussion about that. Ashley, what's your point, your kind of first opening thoughts on what L&D can learn from sales? Or maybe a little bit more around your experience. Yeah, I think, um, as I said, I'm kind of more of a data-driven marketer. So the thing for me that I think is really critical that L&D could be doing a lot more of is continuous iteration. So t trying stuff, experimenting, and then continuing to evolve your approach accordingly. So learning what works with my customers is the same thing that L&D should be doing, doing more of what works and doing less of what doesn't. So that would be my first starting point, I think. Excellent, thank you. And whilst, you know, on the surface that sounds a little simplistic, we know that underneath that there is tons of work, tons of stuff, all those different layers. We will definitely come back to Ashley. Thank you. And Mike, last but by no means least, what are some of the things that you're thinking about with regards to what L&D can learn from sales? I think one of the most important pieces is to um, get rid of your own biases. And one way that you can get rid of those biases is by asking questions. Not asking questions with an expectation that you know what the response is going to be, but asking questions with the desire to learn more about what the customer is feeling, what the end user is feeling, what journey they're working on going through. And realizing that the first answer to that question is not always the right answer to that question. It's important to continue to go deeper and deeper. And if you're just working through one data point, your uh, your perspective is limited. So include others in those discussions and just keep asking questions. So ask questions. Really love that, Mike. Thank you. And whether you mean the same kind of data as Ashley or not, it's obviously going to be a theme and we will come back to that. Claire, let me come to you first on this because I put your, your thought about the transactional work into the chat window. And Lindsay says, if it's short-term and transactional, you're seeing as integrated and part of the business and activity yeah. will start happening without you. What are your thoughts about that, Claire, some of the, the challenges that we see and why do we need to move away from just this? Yeah, I yes, want absolutely. And you know, there is something to be said for some of that um, kind of order taking approach, just as there is that space in sales as well. Um, so for small low value initiatives, absolutely sometimes that's the best route. Um, but in the case where you want to have a real impact and a return on investment, then we need to have a, um, a strong degree of relationship building. And so um, both Ashley and Mike have, have mentioned in terms of understanding different stakeholders, but also a good degree of credibility. And Ashley, your point about using data, um, which helps to demonstrate where you've had the impact before and what will then uh, potentially impact other issues that L&D are trying to solve helps to establish that level of, cre of credibility. That allows them to move into a more business partner, consultative L&D role, um, which is, becomes more proactive then. So in terms of listening and becoming intimate with customer needs, as, as Mike says, but also bringing insight through credibility of having expertise in that area is really important. Thank you. I really love that point about really building those relationships. And I find in my own business, the more I do and the bigger contracts that I work on, actually, the more time I'm spending on building relationships to make it make sure that it's not transactional, exactly as you say. Uh, and Mike knows this because Mike and I have been chatting about this quite a lot over the last few weeks. Um, Mike, I'm going to come to you next on this point, actually, because there's a, a couple of points here in the chat. Garima says, great point, Mike. I wonder what are some questions people ask on the initial discovery meeting, how to move the client past their initial natural responses to delve deeper? Because it's so easy when somebody says to you, 
my team need training on X to go, okay, we've got Y. That will solve the problem. So, so Mike, tell us more about that. Yeah, so I, I mean, one of our challenges, we, we like to help people. Like we're all in service-oriented roles. We want to help people accomplish the thing they want to do. So we try to fix problems pretty quickly. And the challenge you run into when you try to fix problems really quickly is you're guessing one or the other. You're guessing a solution. And if you're guessing it, you're either going to be right or you're going to be wrong. But there's a 50-50 shot there, right? So um, uh, the thing that I think the most important question we can all ask, and we were all familiar with this back when we were two years old, but it's asking why. And then asking why again. And then asking why again. And not to the point of being a, um, a pain in the butt, but to the point of really wanting to understand what's the core justification or reason behind what they're trying to do and why that thing is important. I think too often we overcomplicate the questions we ask by bringing our own biases and trying to start a lot smarter than we all are. If you stick with who, what, why, where, when, and how, you can get a better sense for the story, the journey that your customer is trying to go through and not react to their request but take a proactive approach to designing a solution that aligns with what they're trying to accomplish. Thank you. And I've made a, just a, a point in the chat window that actually when we take those orders and fill them, we can make people happy in the short term, which feels good. But actually, if we're not doing them the correct service, it's going to do everybody harm. Exactly as Claire said, it's not going to be delivering what the business needs and building those relationships. Ashley, how do you see this about... Um, really working with your customer, asking thing to kind of point out in terms of data that I'm talking about, it's a combination of qualitative and quantitative data. So it shouldn't just be a case of asking our customers or our learners what they want and need, but it's also understanding their behaviors, what actually is working. Because my experience with consumers is, you know, sometimes they say they don't want stuff, but actually they will consume it and they will behave differently compared to what they actually believe that they want or need. So I think having a, a good cross-section of data is super important, first and foremost. Um, and I think I, I kind of, when you were talking about the who, what, when, where, and why there, Mike, I also wrote down, you were asking why a lot. And another thing I do a lot in marketing is say, so what? So, OK, someone came to my website. So what? What does that mean? Like, that, you know, data in and of itself doesn't really signify much. So we need to dig a lot deeper here to identify trends and begin to truly understand the behaviors of our learners a lot deeper than those kind of superficial initial kind of statistics. I really like that. It's about context. It's about trends. It's about interpreting that data. Ashley, do you find that you've always been interested in data? Are you Definitely a number the cruncher? Are you I did a degree in person, writing, or is it so more I'm about using that to apply um, it to I something? I think the thing for me that I, I absolutely adore about data is it helps me be better at my job. And I think that that is the absolutely most fundamental thing. I can The amount of times I've guessed something that would be an outcome of an A-B test or a multivariate test, it's always wrong. I have no clue. Data is clearly the only way for me to know what I'm doing. And so I think for me that that is, you know, we don't have to be mathematicians and data scientists and build elaborate uh, Excel spreadsheets with pivot tables. You know, there's a lot of really, really great data tools out there, data visualization tools, and a lot of learning platforms these days, which will do some of that for us as well. So I think, you know, we, we shouldn't be so afraid of it because I know it's daunting, but there's a lot, a lot of tools that can help us make, make life a lot easier too. Love that. It was a bit of a leading question because I've spoken about that before about, you know, if you ask me two plus two right now, I'd, I'd probably faint. But I love data for the same reasons, that you can ask it questions and find out and be curious. Uh, Cara North says in the chat, statistics don't lie, but liars use statistics. I haven't heard that one before, Cara, and I really like that. Um, and Jack says that's a really good addition to the why yep. question. You know, so what does that mean? And that's where that data and those conversations and those questions come in. Let me come back to uh, what Teresa had said in the chat window. So Teresa said a little bit earlier on, uh, question, what can L&D learn from sales? Answer, to be able to handle objections, to forecast, to be great questioners and listeners, which we're touching on at the moment, 
and to negotiate. Claire, let me come to you on that because in part a focus on sort of sales training. So how can we look at objection handling and maybe negotiation from an L&D point of view? Because these aren't perhaps traditional skills that we would go and develop. Oh, let's get you unmuted, Claire. That's right. There's, it's usually me who gets it wrong the first time, so I'm very glad it was you today. So tell us a little yeah, bit it's, about it's a really how good we point, can actually. Um, people think that salespeople and L and D people are not similar. It's very different worlds, but actually the skill sets are really comparable. I mean, salespeople have to identify opportunities to create value for their customers to develop a consultative and transformational business relationship, unless they're in short-term transactional sales. And L&D, it's the same. They've got to identify opportunities to create value, but for their organisation. So actually, the same techniques um, are applicable. Um, and in terms of, of developing that value-based relationship and almost pre-handling any objections and limiting those that come up, uh, it is partly linked to the intimacy in the way that you understand client needs that, that Mike describes. And uh, Ashley added some really good questions there as well. So that's part of it too. Um, that often puts you in a space where you are a, a really good relationship manager. But when it comes to the commerciality, it's really difficult because if there's not a burning platform, decisions tend to get postponed. We like the idea of it. We'd love to do this training and development program, but not now. There's bigger initiatives going on. So there's two areas that need to be developed that um, are the same with regards to uh, sales development as well. And one of those is helping people quantify both the pain and the gain of their situation. So what is the loss that's being experienced now due to, um, for example, low conversion rates or uh, limited impact on customer retention, and a real quantification of that loss, because we know from behavioral economics that um, people are more inclined to make a decision based on loss aversion versus gain. So it's really important to quantify that loss and to explore the gain that can be um, driven by the learning and development initiative, which comes back to proving it through the data, um, as Ashley points out. And then the second area that we see that makes a real difference in um, a learning and development person that is not just a relationship manager, but as a business partner, is the management of strategic stakeholders. So understanding in the business who has the power to make decisions and how to influence those people, or if you can't get to them directly, how to use other people underneath them that you do have relationships with to work with those higher level decision makers. And it's just the same as, as the challenge that salespeople face in large, complex decision making environments. Music to my ears, Claire, thank you. And that is all really important and amazing. And something I know I'm grappling with all the time is just the kind of, yeah, but how do I do that? So, so all of that detail comes down to individual tactics of those strategies. So maybe we can get into some of that a little bit more in a moment. Uh, Teresa sharing some uh, thoughts and, and things in the chat window about how, how working in sales in her first career has helped her in L&D. So thank you for that, Teresa. Um, Mike, let's come to you on this next question. So we have a question in the question pod from Lindsay. Thank you, Lindsay, for this question. She asks, any advice on how to get the business used to the questions? Questions can be seen as a way to stall an answer or to push back work to the functional area. So it could be seen as we want training X. You're like, well, why? Why do you want that? I can't do that. That's all down to you and kind of move on to the next fun project. Obviously, that's not the intention, and we don't want it to feel that way. What advice have we got for Lindsay? I don't know. I mean, this is oh, that's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough one. I mean, there, so the, the, uh, what I would start with is show a high level of empathy. Be able to put yourself in the shoes of the person who's asking that thing and demonstrate that you understand the problem from their perspective. If you can demonstrate that you understand the problem from their perspective, then you can have a better conversation about what the desired outcomes are and how you can align and address those desired outcomes. Then if you determine that for whatever reason, either because of time or just call it resources, if there's a lack of resources or an, uh, a higher number of objectives that you've got to accomplish and you have to say no to people, say no to a way that helps them understand why you're saying no. And it's not no because it's a bad idea. 
except sometimes they're bad ideas. But you know, it's not it's not no about just because it's a bad idea. It's no because if we don't do if we do this, then we have to say no to all of these other things, uh, and appeal to that side. Um, so I, that would be that would be where I would start. But you know, you just you can't do everything. And if you try to do everything, you're not going to satisfy anybody, and you're going to get yourself into a situation where. Um, you reduce trust, you're missing on deliverables, and you're going to have less, fewer requests that are coming. I think you make great points there. And back to what Claire was saying right at the opening about building that trust and rapport and gaining um, all of the, I can't remember the word you used, not confidence, but maybe that's where we'll start, Claire. Claire, what are your thoughts on this point from, uh, from Lindsay? Claire, oh, I muted you there, Claire. That's right, I could hear you typing. That's my fault so, this time. That's it's probably not to ask. I muted um, you this time, so let's unmute me, Claire. We hoped that it wouldn't happen because the ideal is you'd have been proactive and been involved in the businesses before they'd come to you with this kind of a request. So the ideal is, and we take this from, from the sales arena as well, that it's, it's the energy business partner's responsibility and, um, and ideally their, their role to build trust enough so that you can work with your business partners to shape the solution before they come to you with a defined need. Because um, the insight that L&D professionals can bring and designers and trainers can bring in terms of needs analysis and then the best way to actually meet that need should help shape what it is that they would request in the first place. So ideally, that shouldn't happen. But in an organisation that's been used to having that kind of transactional relationship with L&D, that's when you have to work really hard to establish why you want to go back and as Mike said, explain why you're not just saying no, you want to go back and understand there might be a better way of doing it, it might be more efficient to do it in another way. If they feel that you're placing self-orientation higher than their needs, that's when trust gets eroded. Really great points there, Claire. Thank you. And, and I really like uh, in the chat window, Teresa had mentioned performance consulting. That's by Nigel Harrison. He's got a book. Um, also, there's action mapping by Kathy Moore. And if you go and have a look on our SoundCloud page under Training Journal, we've got some interviews with Kathy Moore that I did a while ago. So really looking at just that piece that Claire was saying is, it's not saying no, it's going back to the business and understanding so you can make a better version of the response and whatever that intervention needs to be. And much earlier in the chat window, Garima had said, listen to people, really listen, then and only then suggest solutions. So that's part of that whole relationship building as well as the questioning. I want to kind of move on to a slightly different question, actually from Lindsay earlier on in the chat window as well. Lindsay said, in sales, you have to understand the customer to hit targets. I think sometimes in L&D, we fall into a we know best attitude. So Ashley, I'm not necessarily going to ask you to, uh, to comment on the attitude of L&D, but how can we take this idea of, of targets from a sales and a, maybe a marketing point of view well, I think um, the first kind of point to maybe note with sales and marketing targets is they're very typically aligned to business objectives. So, you know, it's very often translated into profit, customer retention, that sort of thing. Whereas oftentimes L&D, and again, you guys can correct me if I'm speaking out of term, but it's not necessarily always about adding business value in that same kind of very profit-based way, I suppose. Um, so the, I guess that would be my first kind of thing is, you know, what are L&D's targets? What are we trying to accomplish as a function? Um, and I think a big thing for me, I actually made a note when um, you guys were talking earlier. And one of the big things for me is that, you know, we same as I said earlier, like I can't possibly know everything. I have to rely on data to make better decisions because I can't know everything and, and nor can any L&D function. They can't know every single thing that every single learner wants. And for me, I think that comes down to a lot of, acceptance and understanding that we have to relinquish control a little bit and accept that our staff are grown-ups and adults look at all of us we're all we're all home-based here by looks of things you know the way that we're working is changing and I think that that's a really big important thing for me is understanding and accepting that it has to be a bit bigger than us and we have to relinquish control a little bit What a lovely different point there about kind of it's not just about us. 
how many of us really work with other teams and other people on that. Mike, let me come to you on this one, because I think you've probably got some ideas and thoughts about actually working with other departments internally in order to get the best for your internal or external client. Uh, or you could be tell me that I'm talking out yeah, of turn. I, so I'm holding up a pencil. Most of us are familiar with this thing, right? I could describe it as a wooden utensil with graphite in the middle that allows me to write. I could describe it as something to write with, or I could describe, say I need someone to build a pencil. But I now have come up with three different ways to describe the same object. And if I go to engineering, depending on which way I describe it, I'm going. the outcome is going to be a bit different. The point that I'm trying to make here is when you go into those individual business units, the expertise you have is from a learning and development perspective, maybe an instructional design perspective. The expertise they have is relative to the perspective that they have inside the organization. It's by taking each of those perspectives together, identifying patterns, connecting the dots, and start starting to build out a better picture uh, that will help you support broader needs inside the organization. When it comes to gaining consensus across organizations, start first with what's important to them. Why do they do the work that they do? How, are they me how do they measure their own success? What are they trying to accomplish? What happens if they don't accomplish those things? And I know these are a lot of questions, but it's gathering that data that will help you identify Hey, here's some other areas where I might be able to help them. They're completely different than Addy or some other cool thing that is you know, reinforces what we know in our head about what's important uh, from a learning perspective or an instructional design perspective. R remember, and I you know Ashley has hit on this a number of times, and Claire has talked about it as well. It is not about you; it's about them, and you know you know what's inside your brain. You've got to use your ears to listen. Love that point. Thank you, Mike. And Claire, in the chat window, Teresa has been saying about L&D targets being aligned. Yeah, so there's been a few organizations who've done this really well. Um, GE has been mentioned, Thompson Reuters has been mentioned. Um, so we, in our experience, we've found it really difficult to work with a business where there is a disparity between objectives. So for example, if we have L&D and, and um, an HR looking at things like um, adoption rates of e-learning, and that's their measure. And then that conflicts with what's happening within the sales and operations um, area of the business, because what they're looking at is performance improvements, for example, GM, um, revenue, growth of accounts, or whatever. And you, it's really hard to link those two things. There's been a couple of mentions in the chat window about aligning L&D objectives to actually fit better with the user group that you're trying to serve. And the academies where we've seen the best successes have had exactly that. So we've gone above the level of adoption, and instead of looking at things like adoption of just access of e-learning, we've looked at how that's been used to impact on, first of all, of course, um, uh, competencies and behaviours, but then right up to results, and looking at um, conducting a full ROI, ROI analysis on any piece of learning that equates with the objectives of the teams that you're um, you're putting through the learning piece. So I think that. That bringing together of co-objectives is so important, and then that helps it become a collaborative project in itself, because you're both striving towards the same thing. Absolutely. I always remember reading from Andrew Jacobs that, uh, and he did a session at Learning Technologies oh, a couple of years ago now, where he actually doesn't use the phrase L&D aligning to the business, his whole thought was, well, the business goals are L&D goals. And that's really backing up what you said there, Claire. Thank you. Um, Ashley, you put something in the chat window about redefining the purpose of L&D and our goals to move from a push to a pull um, approach. And I want to link this to something that Cara North asked in the chat window much earlier in the session. She said, I'd be interested in how a new L&D person can use sales techniques because they're often order takers. So I know we've gone through that kind of order taker conversation, but for me, these kind I mean, of things are linked. It's definitely a tough one because it, it somewhat depends on the habits. culture that they are ingratiated into within the organization. So it's all good and well coming in with great ideas and new innovative ways to change learning cultures, for example. But if you know the, the decision makers within the business aren't really bought into that, 
you may just find that you're kind of fighting a, a difficult ba battle. You know, I've been there many times with marketing functions where I even have data to substantiate what I'm saying and, you know, leaders don't necessarily want to buy into that. So I think, um, you know, if you can find small opportunities for um, incremental improvements or, as I've said, if you can, if you can start to correlate um, learning outcomes with data or business performance improvements, so things like sales training, product knowledge training, you know, those are quite easy to, or more easy, I would say, to start to correlate performance compared to something softer like leadership or management, which is obviously a whole separate conversation. You know, how do you prove that you, you know, your leadership has improved? That's a, a much longer story, I think. Um, so I, I guess, I guess the thing for me would again, you know, ask a lot of questions, start to really try and understand your people a bit better. Um, and even if that means that, you know, you're still kind of just devising and delivering more kind of prescriptive style training initially, if you can start to ensure that that type of training hits the mark, maybe at least it's more micro learning, maybe it's shorter, maybe it's more rich media based rather than just repetitious next button type stuff. Maybe if it's the ecosystem or environment that they access it in, these kind of small incremental gains can at least be a good starting point for us to help evolve over time. Really great point, Ashley. Thank you. And then the culture and your direct line manager, your colleagues, all of those things have a huge impact when you're a new to a business, but also new to a role or an industry. I shared in the chat window earlier on, there was a particular company I worked in many years ago, and I was the person to take the consultative approach almost just naturally. It's what I did. Um, but that got really great feedback. I made that into a really tiny case study, literally a page, shared it with my colleagues in L&D, shared it with my manager. It became more of the approach, shared it with HR and our business partners. And it was something really small that had just a tiny ripple effect, but actually quite an important change. So that's something to really take on board. And Tim Royds in the chat says, uh, about the kind of the business alignment question. He says, this is an important part of the conversation. If L&D isn't clear on how the proposed support is going to drive sales achievement, why should the sales director understand this? And if they don't, why should they buy into the proposed solution? I refer to sales here specifically, but substitute marketing director, finance director, or sales director in just the same way. So it's a really good point about bringing those together and the importance of that. Thank you, Tim. Mike, I want to come to you next on this question. This is from, uh, this is from a, in the chat window from Garima. Garima says, sometimes we, as L&D people, come later in the decision-making process, especially as vendors. Clients have already made up their mind on what they need, why they need it, and here's the budget, and here's the timelines. Now, that's certainly been my experience a lot of the time, too. Uh, Garima says, one has to keep finding ways to add value and create trust even as an order taker. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, it's, and not to talking cliches or analogies, but if you're playing American football or you're playing hockey, you're playing two different sports with two different sets of rules. The rules are already made before you get on the ice. The rules are already made before you get on the field. Accept the fact that the rules have been made and there may be a time where you just can't make that change. You can't influence or impact something because of either budget or authority or timeline or what it, whatever it is. You can shift gears, support them in that initial initiative, and then keep focused on the long term. Um, but you know, sometimes I would just be honest with yourself. If you get into a situation where someone says, look, here's how we need to do it. The decision has already been made. We can't go through the influence. There's no sense of just beating your head up against the wall. Take care of it and move it forward unless you don't think you can execute. If you don't think you can execute, if you're not going to be able to deliver, then go back and say, look, here's the risk. I don't think that this is going to turn out the way that you want it to. Um, and you know, Sometimes you have to fire a client, and that could be an internal client that you have to fire. Um, as frustrating as it is and as tough as it is, and don't fail alone. Make sure you get the buy-in from your management team, your leadership within the organization. Sometimes you have to fire a client, and that could be an internal or an external client. Absolutely, and it, it can sound a bit scary at first, especially if you're a vendor or a small business. 
Um, I always remember my dad, who was self-employed as a sort of bathroom and kitchen tiler. He wouldn't necessarily use the term fire a client, but his quote would be quite a lot bigger for the next piece of work. And magically, they, they might not uh, take on his work. So that's something that I've taken on board. Um, so Ashley, let's come to you, because it was, it was Tim who sort of mentioned this idea about um, the importance of the conversation with yeah, how the I mean, support I think the, is the, It was kind of an interesting point, because I guess, to me, Tim's point was all around, you know, is it adding value of any kind? And I think, you know, sometimes L&D's got into this kind of very compliance-based mindset where we're just delivering training for an outcome, um, which is, you know, typically completion. Um, and I think there is a lot more to do with learning, learning on the job. You know, what I won't open the can of worms of what is learning at work, um, but I think, you know, that is a conversation that we should be reflecting on. It is much more than structured, delivered e-learning, um, classroom-based training, blended programs, you know, the such like are integral, but there's also a lot more to organizational learning um, than just that. And I think understanding a little bit more about kind of much broader goals and, and you know, defining things like KPIs, what are we actually trying to achieve as a business? What's your strategy for the year? How does the business strategy then translate into the learning and development strategy? And how are we going to measure that? And I think that that's really important and maybe a step that a lot of us are sometimes neglecting and then therefore really struggling to prove the value of what we're doing long term. You make such great points there. And this is the stuff that sometimes we struggle with and we need to focus on. We need to start you know, following you guys and start listening and reading. Yeah, so Ashley describes the approach that the best salespeople take, basically, which is, is if you think about each um, area of business in your organization, then understanding the KPIs that, that they are tasked with achieving, understanding their challenges and achieving these, and then understanding the wider goals which link to the organizational strategy is really important because that's what centers around why your L&D initiatives will have the impact. But going back to the points uh, that have been coming up with regards to entering kind of late cycle when people seem to have a solution already in mind um, and the fact, as Mike said, sometimes you just have to run with that solution. So ideally you should be proactive and so the best salespeople and account uh, growers that we know work early to shape those needs and they, you can do that through a variety of things so regular meetings with these departments or getting on their um, agendas or attending their internal departmental meetings things like that just to try and keep up to date with the lie of the land and what's happening and changing and challenging for them and then having the skills to take an agile approach so we're looking at sales agility in um, uh, very specifically at the moment in part because what we see is that the best sales people can take requests from clients that are late cycle, as in we need this, X, Y, Z, this kind of very tight scope, and be agile enough to use skills to bring the customer back into that needs analysis frame again, where they're okay to answer questions like the ones that Mike and Ashley described. But that's, that's quite a skill set. Um, and then it's understanding when to just say, yep, we can do that and be transactional, and when to try and move that conversation back. But the idea is you've got in there first and you've shaped it from the start. Love it. I love that there's different points at which you can interact. And I know certainly something I found is I can go, yep, absolutely, I can do that, no problem. The other thing we can do additionally or instead of or... Yeah, so, I mean, there's a great book that's out there called Trusted Advisor, and we talk about being trusted advisors and wanting to be trusted advisors in, inside organizations, and I'm sure as service-oriented folks. But uh, in order to be a trusted advisor, you have to be trusted and have the ability to provide advice, which means you ha should have that business acumen and understand what's happening inside the business. Another thing that is important to realize is sometimes the business owner doesn't understand where they fit in the business. I mean, it, it happens. Sometimes they don't understand how their objectives align with the overall overarching goals of the business. So asking those questions can start to reveal that. But 
um, keep in mind, don't ask those questions in a group. Don't put them in a situation where they are going to feel embarrassed or get into a situation where it reveals a lack of understanding in a group setting. Take them aside, have a one-on-one -on -one discussion. And then if they are struggling, ask them the question, who else can we bring into the discussion who might be able to help us understand what we're trying, understand this component, have an area of expertise, give them an out um, and demonstrate that you can be an extension of their team by asking some of the questions of another person that they maybe should have already understood, known the answers, but now you're the one who's asking that question. I really like that. Thank you. One of the things I've picked up from you recently, Mike, is, is that point about who do else do we get involved? Now, I've always been good at that from a consultancy point of view, but then if we look at that from a sales point of view, and whether that's getting sign off of the budget internally or making a sale externally or anything in between, just being able to ask that basic question of who signs this off? Do they need to be here? Who else is going to be in the room that makes that decision can make the difference between you coming away thinking, yes, we've got a sale, and then a week later going, it's gone down the pan through to we've got this going and it's moving forward. Um, Ashley, what are your thoughts about this from a marketing point of view and maybe from bringing in data as well? Sorry, just unmuting myself. Um, yeah, I think that, that that point's really interesting and something I've chatted quite a lot about with our COO at Thrive because um, me and her get ranting about changing learning cultures and stuff quite often when we're working at home together. We're both based in Brighton. Um, and I think, you know, the, the big thing for me is, you know, sometimes, especially things like LMS implementation, we get so blinkered and blindsided with this giant project, this huge implementation, perhaps there's a massive migration, and we forget that actually one of the most integral things that we're doing this for is, is to change the way that people interact and engage with learning. But what we do is we launch it and then we expect people to arrive and unfortunately if you build it they will come does not apply. And we really need to start working harder and thinking much more like marketers as L&D professionals to start to how can we engage way before implementation, whether that be a platform or a learning program, even just a single module if, it, if it's really pertinent. And I think, you know, as you said, there's absolutely reams and reams of marketing content where you could literally change the word customer to learner and it would absolutely apply in many possible contexts. So I think campaigns, early campaigns, way beyond implementation could, could put us in, in much better stead to start improving engagement, um, start building some advocacy and going back to that trust thing that we talked about very early doors in terms of getting, getting further buy-in and wider trust across the organization. Great points to bring us back to what Claire had said earlier on about building those relationships. And uh, Teresa in the chat window had said L&D, like good salespeople, often have the benefit of being well connected and networked. And a little bit earlier on in the chat, Lindsay had said, we have also found a greater focus on marketing the programs we pull together with the business to the business so that they know when we're actually launching content and um, they have been involved in. So it's all really kind of kind of interlinking all of those things together. Now, Mike, I know you've done some work around kind of the sales journey and what that looks like for maybe a typical customer or client and how that looks internally for you. Uh, I mean, I think the big piece is understand where your customer is today, however you define customer, where they want to be tomorrow, however you define customer, and make sure it's about where they want to be, not where you want them to be. Um, because sometimes you know and sometimes you don't. But so where they are today, where they want to be tomorrow, and then just start plotting backward. How do you go through how do, how do you get from where you are today to where you want to be? If I'm driving from Phoenix to uh, Los Angeles, I head west. Uh, I go through a couple of towns. I go through Litch, Litchfield Park. I go through Blythe. I go through Riverside. I go through um, uh, Pasadena. If at any point in time I find myself going in Albuquerque, I'm going the wrong way. And this is where that designed 
backward design based approach can really help you uh, check to make sure that you're moving in the in the right direction. So take the time, put yourself in their shoes, realize that you have your own biases, validate that through questions. Brilliant. Thank you very much for your tips there. And uh, Post says, uh, I think we can use what customer experience teams use, such as the customer journey mapping, employee journey mapping. Um, yeah, absolutely. So there are the stages that anybody goes through in terms of decision making for a large complex decision are the same with regards to whether you're trying to um, uh, win a new logo business and the customers that go through those decision making processes or convince a number of uh, senior business sponsors um, to take on a, a new L&D project or to shape their thinking around it. So understanding those processes and how people go through decision making is really important, um, not just in terms of how you structure your learning because that's often the same as well. You're actually trying to convince your learners to change their behaviour. So there's, there's parallels right across the world of L&D, um, and it's just in terms of that, that transferability of learning of, across departments, it's really important, some of the, the comments coming up about how well connected L&D tend to be, you will know which initiatives are going on across the business, and will know where there can be overlaps, efficiency savings, sharing of information, so that's when you can really move into that trusted business partner environment. Really like that, Claire. Thank you so much. And it reminds me of a time I was working with a customer, and I spent an hour in a conversation with them, and it was it was part consultancy, part almost teaching them about what to go and focus on, and part objection handling. It was quite interesting the different mix of those skills that came sure, in. Sure. So I kind of just wanted to build on what Poe had said there um, around. Uh, customer journey mapping and advocacy was also mentioned a little bit earlier. And something I just kind of wanted to encourage you guys to perhaps look at is a transition from a typical marketing funnel where we have get people into the funnel, we feed them through, and then they drop out and they become a customer, and we never see them ever again, and hopefully they have a good time. There's now this new concept called the marketing flywheel out there, which is much more about using the energy that you've, you've, you've put into these people that become our customers. So, you know, your advocates within L&D, for example, how do we continue to feed those people way beyond them becoming a customer in, in order to continue to harness and use that energy that we've already invested so that we're not losing the energy that we have? L&D teams are not big, typically. They don't have huge amount of resources. So continuing to reuse and um, repurpose where we can is something I certainly think we should be doing more of also. There you go. I had to unmute myself there for a moment as well. Thank you very much. Uh, now, we're going to come off of webcam after all of these great points, but don't worry. Ashley, Claire, and Mike are staying here, as am I. We're moving into our reflection piece now. So let's just make sure this works for absolutely everybody. So have a look on your screen. You should be able to see the T text tool. We use it every month. You should be used to it by now, I'm hoping. Click on that. Click on the whiteboard. Type your name and click again. Now, if you are on a mobile device, oh, we don't have anybody here on a tablet, so that's all good. So we've got somebody who's practicing. Thank you very much. Teresa's done that. Haley's done it. Well done. Somebody's deleted my name altogether, which, which is fine too. We're practicing. The very first tool in the toolbox is uh, like an arrow tool, and you can use that to pick up and move around your text. So if you've written over the top of someone, it's no problem. You can pick it up and move it around. So let's just have a quick practice, because what we're going to do in just a second is go and find out a little bit about what you're thinking after this conversation. We've had nearly an hour discussing this, and some really great points have come through. So let's move on to our action point here. What is it you're going to do after today? So go grab that T text tool, type on the screen, and click away to share your writing with everyone else. What is it that you're thinking? Yeah. 
this is what I'm going to do after today. Is it something you're going to, to look up? Is it something you're going to do? Is What are some of the things that you're going to do as a result of the conversation today? Conversation's great, but you need to go and do something to make it work. Let's see what we've got coming up on the screen. Do remember to click away when you've finished so we share it for everybody. And you can also use that arrow tool at the top of the screen. Um, to move that around if you need to. Uh, Mary, no problem on needing to get going. Thank you so much for coming along. I'm really glad that you were listening in. That's half the point, Mary, so no problem at all. Let's have a look at what's on our whiteboard. Already bookmark the links. Going to look at where I can improve. That's brilliant. There's been loads of links shared by all of our speakers and other people today, so that's absolutely great. Uh, somebody says, I'm going to think more on the flywheel. Ashley, I think it was you that mentioned the flywheel, and somebody has um, asked about that in the chat as well. Ashley, can you tell us just briefly again about that flywheel and what it is and why we should look it up, please? Yeah, so it's basically an evolution from a, an atypical sales and marketing funnel where we obviously start with a, a huge volume of potential leads and they, they get nurtured and go through a sales funnel until a very small amount of them are transitioned into a customer. However, typically, they often fall out the end of the funnel and there's not a lot done after that. So it's kind of tying back in with that customer experience journey that we've talked about a little bit as well. So the idea of the flywheel is much more about harnessing and, and utilizing and recycling all that energy that we put into building advocates and converting leads into customers and um, reusing that energy, that word of mouth, that social proof, that user generated content all of that lovely stuff, which we have quite a lot of in, in L&D as well, actually, um, and feeding that back into our approaches and our strategy in order to continue to build trust, improve our approaches, et cetera. Ashley, what a great description. Thank you so much. Uh, also, on the whiteboard, uh, do more to help my internal L&D contacts look Good. I love that point. We were chatting about it in the chat window. Mike Simmons often talks about helping people to be the hero of their story. Mike, let's get you unmuted. In, in a little tiny nutshell of a story, what is this whole thing about being the hero and the guide? Well, remember, in, we all have our own story that we're working through, and we're and we are that hero in our own individual story. The challenge comes up when you're working with a customer and you're trying to be the hero and they're trying to be the hero and now you're competing for resources. And Donald Miller talks a lot about this in Building a Story Brand and he's been on the podcast. If you go to episode 65 and episode 105, you'll hear him talk about this in more detail. But the most powerful role in the story is really the role of the guide because the guide is the one who delivers the plan to the hero that helps them make the transition from where they are today to where they want to be in the future. They also can help identify what the stakes are and the risk of not making that transition. So help your customers go through their hero journey by being the guide. Stop trying to be the hero. Thank you very much. I really liked that, Mike, when I first heard about it from you. Because all of a sudden we thought, oh, okay, well, actually, if we're the guide for them, as somebody put on the, the whiteboard here, we can make them look good, and then they feel good, they've achieved what they need, and it really helps build up that kind of relationship. So there's some interesting thinking to put in there. Also on the whiteboard, somebody has said here, consider more bringing other people into the discussion, if necessary, to provide clarity for the customer and myself. What a great point here about making sure that you've got the right people on both sides. So it could be from the L&D or the vendor side, as well as what's going on for the individual that you're speaking with and making sure that you've got the right people from their team or company as well. Uh, somebody else has put, use more analogies in my sales conversation. Mike is an expert storyteller. Love that. Thank you very much. Underneath, being more aware or intentional of how conversations with customers go. 
Claire, let me come to you on that one because you've talked a lot about relationship building and making sure that you achieve something that people come back to you. So Claire, let's get you unmuted and how can people be more intentional in those conversations? Yeah, good question. So um, some of this comes down, obviously, to, to being agile in the moment. However, there is um, an aspect of planning that should be done before you have these conversations with customers. And essentially, you can plan to address certain areas, such as their KPIs, challenges, and wider goals, through some of the questioning that, um, that Mike and Ashley described earlier on, such as what are the major challenges your department are facing at the moment? What is the, um, what is the effect of a, the competitive climate on you at the moment? Uh, are there any changes in the marketplace that are going to have an impact on you achieving your KPIs? So there can be some planning and also some planning around the more um, kind of top level macro environment as well. So what is it that's happening to your organization at the moment? What are the pressures that you're under? What is your um, uh, business plan for the next five years and how is that being impacted by pressures such as new competitor entry? All of these things can be used to plan those, uh, those conversations with your customers in the different departments. That brings insight, shows your credibility, and also shows that it develops trust because it shows that you're interested in them and their issues and their challenges, rather than just going to them and saying, okay, so you know, what training do you need? How can we help you? It's much more insightful. Love that. Thank you very much, Claire, for explaining that. Uh, and as you've said about action plan and aligning to the business, that's exactly what somebody's put on the whiteboard here. Somebody else has put marketing. It's a little bit, little bit general there rather than being a bit more specific, but focusing on the marketing and how you can do that within the context of you and your organization sounds good to me. And uh, somebody also, the last thing here is somebody has said, I have copied some of the links around selling and also look at more of the ways I can engage people more. What great feedback from everybody there. Thank you. I really hope that you can put some of that into context. And also, if any of you want to share your journey, your thoughts, your lessons, what you've what you've taken from today, you could always write a, a short blog or opinion piece or something like that to share on our website. Or if you prefer, we've got a LinkedIn group. You can just go and share a little post and say, this little, little nugget helped me today. Um, and this is what I've gone and done with it and actually start that conversation. Uh, and thank you very much. A little arrow there about the copying the marketing links. I get it now. Thank you very much for that. So it leaves me to say a humongous Thank you to our wonderful speakers, to Mike Simmons from Catalyst Sale, to Ashley Sinclair from Thrive Learning, and from Claire Cologne at Imparta. We've had a really great conversation today with them. They are more than happy for you to get in contact with them. So I'm just sharing their websites and their uh, Twitter handles. You can go and find them on LinkedIn as well. So thank you very much for their insight and their conversations. You can go and continue your conversation on Twitter. Let us know, what did you learn today? What did you think about? What did you enjoy? What, what did you not enjoy, quite frankly? It's always good to get, get that feedback. You know that our, all of our sessions are going to be available online. You can go and have a look at the Training Journal website anytime you like. And also, this session will be on Twitter very soon. And our very next webinar is all about understanding your organization and its people. It's actually kind of a good conversation to have after this one, I think. So it's kind of continuing that conversation. That is next month, 28th of May, 4 p.m. UK time, 11 a.m. Eastern. And we very much look forward to seeing you there. Thank you very much. Have a great time. Your questions, your impact, your conversations have all been brilliant today. See you all.